called some people it's friday thank heavens and some of us it's still only thursday so welcome guys it's it's fun to see you guys here it's 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 awesome so cinema camera why should you buy it why shouldn't you so i get this question all the time like hey i saw you rigged out the sony a7s3 or your black magic camera the xt4 whatever it is why don't you just go and buy a cinema camera? You're gonna spend all that money on rigging it out. Sometimes it ends up being $4,000, $5,000, or $7,000 once it's fully rigged out. So why don't you just invest and buy a cinema camera? Well, one of my first answers to this is the fact that cinema cameras are freaking expensive, right? Depending on what you get, you're at least starting at about $6,000 for most cinema cameras entry level. And then on top of that, you still have to do all of your rigging and accessories. So let's say your jumping in point is like the Sony um, FS5 or the Sony FX6. Those are five, $6,000 or the Red Komodo, $6,000. Well, some of those cameras are ready to go out of the box, but things like the Red Komodo and a lot of the other ones still need a lot of rigging out. And for me, Anytime I shoot on one of those cameras, I've shot on RED, I've shot on Canon C300, Sony, I've shot on pretty much any of the modern day cinema cameras you can think of, I've probably shot on it. But every time I shoot on it, there's some rigging to it. Honestly, it's very seldom that I shoot on those cameras stripped down here and there, depending on which one it is. But usually there's some sort of rigging. So let's say you spend your money and you buy that cinema camera. Well, you're probably going to end up getting some sort of top handle for it. So you can hold it the way you want or maybe an external monitor because even cinema cameras getting really expensive, six, ten, twelve thousand $12,000 have usually really small crappy LCDs that just aren't that high resolution. So you need other solutions anyways, like you would need when you're actually fully bringing out a mirrorless or DSLR camera. So that's one of the main reasons for rigging out a smaller mirrorless camera is all the cost savings because you might buy a mirrorless camera that's only 1200 bucks, 1500 bucks. Let's say you get the pocket 4k, it's much cheaper. And then you spend that money rigging it out. And still it's going to be less money than it would have been like probably half the cost that it would have been to get a cinema camera. So the first thing is huge cost savings. I know most of us are indie filmmakers, videographers doing this kind of film work locally. We're not shooting in Hollywood most likely. I mean, if you are, let me know in the comments. I'd love to know. So that's reason number one, but jump back into the comments here for a second. See where where everyone's at. Maurice Williams, what's up? He says he's in Fort Worth, Texas. How's it going, man? Sounds like a crazy day in Texas. 100 car pile up over there. Hope everyone's safe. Oh, that is crazy. I know it's winter's been a little bit nuts. So um, unorthodox media, hi from Trinidad and Tobago in the Car Caribbean. Is it Caribbean or Caribbean? I never know. Pirates of the Caribbean. That's cool. Welcome. Uh, Tactical Traveler. Hi from Tampa, Florida. Welcome. Let's see. So how is everyone doing? Marvelous. Hi from California. Um, Sideral. How's it going? Winter Mute. Zcam E2 is a great cine camera for cheap. Yes. So we're going to get into that. We're going to get into a couple alternatives as well. So uh, awesome. Um, Act shot Jane says, Hey, what's up? Says cinema cameras are too much hassle for daily use. Um, I totally get that. Let's see. Yeah, we're gonna get into more questions here very shortly. Uh, Scott Mor Morgasson says he's in Arkansas. And Santi Romero asking about the pocket 6K. Yeah, so I want to get into some of your questions here um, in just a second. Um, I would love to answer them. So keep the questions coming. I'm gonna let them pile up just a little bit and then I'll start responding to them. So stick around, I will get to all your questions. Um, yeah, I love that. I love having that interaction with you guys, it's fun. So one of the main things like I've already discussed is the cost savings, excuse me, of getting a DSLR mirrorless camera over getting, of course, a cinema camera. That's that's the number one, right? I think all of us go, hey, if I could buy a RED camera or an Aerial X or something, You'd, you'd probably do it, right? I mean, if you could, if you could afford it. But let's say that you saved up and you could, you know, then maybe you would. Um, but for me, a lot of people will ask, you know, why didn't you just buy a cinema camera that, that costs you six, $7,000 to rig out in total? Well, so here I have the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. When I bought it, it was still $2,500. So anyone else that got this at $2,000, man, you lucked out. I paid $500 more, uh, which is a bummer. But um, so this is fully rigged out. 
um, you know, at least to what I need right now. And the great thing about this is all of these parts are very universal. So I can take almost every single piece of equipment off of this and move it to the next camera. I can put it on the new Sony a7S III. I can put it on my Fujifilm X-T4, whatever it is that I want to shoot with. Or I can move a lot of this gear over to a cinema camera if I ever rent one for a shoot or if I ever buy one. Um, almost all of it switches over except for the obvious things like a camera cage. Those are, of course, proprietary to the exact camera. But, you know, I've got side handle monitors, top handles, follow focus. Of course, the lenses I just talked about recently. My last video, the Pictor zooms, V-mount battery setup, everything here. Of course, 15 millimeter rods. And I, this isn't fully rigged out. I don't have the map box on there. Um, but all of that gear can swap over to a new build, right? Doesn't cost a penny. I swap it over all the time. And so that's a big reason that I just didn't go out and buy a cinema camera right off because I didn't have the money to rig this out. But over years I've bought and you know, I've bought more and more of the gear and equipment than I needed to do that. And I think a lot of you guys are in the same boat. Let me know. Did you buy all of your rigging and accessories like all at once, kind of like going to Amazon, add it up? make this big shopping cart and then just swipe that credit card? Or have you kind of built it up over time? I know that's how it's been for me. It's just like, hey, I get this, I get that, you know, and it kind of all builds over time until it becomes, you know, what I really want it to be. Whoa, almost took out my eye there on my mic. Whoa. Um, yeah, so let me know. I'm getting a little overexcited. Sorry, guys. I just love talking about this stuff. So, you know, that's how it's been for me. It's been a gradual progression. So all the comments that I get, um, about, hey, why didn't you just buy that cinema camera? Well, the, the easy answer is I didn't have the money to buy a cinema camera right up front. But over time, I've been able to invest back into my equipment and my rig. And I think it's the same way for a lot of you guys that you don't have the money right off the bat, but you buy the nicer lenses or the little pieces and bits of equipment that you want as time goes on and you're able to invest that back into your gear. So that's just a big reason there. So let's get into a couple of the questions. I wanna make sure that I answer them before anyone jumps off. Um, it's really important to talk to you guys and see what's going on. So let's see here. Uh, Marvelous, back to your question. He says, um, says, well, I don't know if it's a girl or a boy, but it says, Marvelous. He says, I'm trying to save up and buy an upgrade from my Canon Rebel T7. I'm thinking of getting a Pocket 4K rig once I have enough. Should I? Yes, I definitely think so. I mean, obviously it depends on what you're trying to do, but the Pocket 4K is such an incredible camera with the image quality that comes out of it. It's almost identical to the Pocket 6K, except obviously it has that micro four thirds sensor, and this is giving you a crop sensor and EF mount, but essentially the image and color science is basically the same. Um, everything you're getting out of it's about the same. I used to have the Canon Rebel T3i. That was the first camera that I started on. I love that camera, that's the OG for me. And so the T7 I know is in that same family. Um, it was the first camera I could, got that could shoot 1080p, you know, 30 or 24 frames per second, which was just awesome with the flip out screen and everything. So yes, I think upgrading from the T7 is a great way to go. And if you already have Canon lenses, maybe get the Pocket 6K. Um, there's so many of them out there now, you could probably find it used and you can just directly put those Canon mount lenses onto the Pocket 6K instead of using any adapters at all. So that might be worth looking into. All right, um, Santi Romero says, isn't the Pocket 6K considered a cinema camera or a film camera? Yes, yeah, so that's just branding, right? I mean, is it a cinema camera? Is it not? It's a big debate, I think, for a lot of people. My personal opinion, uh, it's a hybrid between a cinema camera and a like mirrorless camera. I mean, obviously they just call it the Pocket 6K, you know, the Pocket Cinema Camera, but is it really a cinema camera? No, I don't think so. I think it's honestly more of a mirrorless camera, but they just have called it a cinema camera. The things that make it more of a cinema camera is the fact that it doesn't have a viewfinder on it, um, but a lot of cinema cameras actually do have viewfinder, um, but that's just one thing I can think of as well as, you know, it has all the different features built into it um, that are like video centric, right? So you have zebras and um, like waveforms and uh, all the types of tools that you would need on a video camera and it's not really set up for photography at all. So, I mean, let me know, do you disagree? Is the, in the comments below, is the Pocket 6K actually a cinema camera or isn't it? I would venture to say that it's not really truly a cinema camera because most cinema cameras have full XLR inputs. This one does have a mini, which is nice, um, but it doesn't have built-in variable NDs. Um, it doesn't have a good battery solution. The battery life, as everyone knows, is terrible. It's 15, 20 minutes. Um, so 
yeah, I don't think it's quite a cinema camera. Just, just my opinion. But all right, um, let's see what else is going on here. Um, Jonathan, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mess up. I always mess up the names. Natividad says, "Hi, Chad here from the Philippines. Welcome, welcome. Awesome." Um, TJ Digital he says. Build over time is the best way. Yeah, so like we were talking about earlier, you know, are you building out your gear over time, slowly adding to it, making it the full rig that you want, or did you kind of buy it all at once? Yeah, I, I think that's how a lot of us are doing is kind of constantly our rig is evolving. I wish I've taken like pictures over the years. I mean, I guess I have with this channel, but like pictures over the years, the evolution of my rig has definitely changed over time. I bet your guys is, has as well. Um, Adventure Production says, any affordable cinema zooms for full frame? Yeah, so I think you're referring to my last video that I did all about the Pictor zooms, which only cover crop sensor APS-C. These are seriously the best cinema lenses I've ever used at this price point. Um, they're just incredible. There's not any full frame cinema lenses out there that are zoom lenses that are affordable right now. They just do not exist. Hopefully they're coming in the future, but I don't know of any right now. I mean, I went into a pretty deep dive on that on my last live stream. You could check that out, went really deep on that whole topic. And no, there's no full frame cinema lenses that are affordable, unfortunately. I hope they come. Maybe um, DZO Film will make them. They have full frame prime lenses. Maybe they'll move into it. But let me just say that the reason that they haven't made full frame cine zoom lenses and made them affordably is because it's incredibly expensive to do. It's way more glass, the lens is way bigger. Um, it to cover a larger image sen image sensor. So it's just much more expensive to engineer and do. It's not very cheap to do right now. So that's why they're just not widely available. It's expensive technology. Um, yeah, so let's see here. Starfall Productions, what's up? How you doing? Uh, Robert Frampton says, I have purchased so much rigging that small rig sends me flowers. What? <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, I haven't gotten any special gifts from small rig yet. Um, man, that would be nice though. I mean, I feel like they should at this point, I should be like fully sponsored. I should be like a racing, like a NASCAR racing guy, right? With like small rig, like leather jacket or something, maybe put it on the side of my truck. It might look kind of cool, but no, I, I, I wish man, small rig is fun. I, I spent way too much with them. I have a new little side handle coming. I'm excited to share with you guys on the channel. Um, that's going to be fun. I love small rig and that's a whole nother topic and I don't want to go down into that just yet, but, um, let's see. Davidson's laughing. Uh, let's see. Costell and Doan talking about buying, he bought a tilt -a cage and handle. He's got a five inch monitor. He needs a seven inch one in the future. I'll buy a follow focus and so on. Yeah. So, uh, Costell, Costell, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, yeah, it looks like you have, you know, a, gr a really great setup already. Um, the seven inch monitor, maybe not necessary. I've had a couple different seven inch monitors and I usually find that they're almost a little too big. So just a little personal advice. This is the five inch small HD and I have the Ninja V, Ninja 5, whatever you want to call it, also five inches. And I find that it's just the perfect size to frame up, see my image, get things in focus, and it's not too bulky hanging off of the rig. So maybe you can save your money um, unless you really need something bigger. I don't know, the seven inch, a little bit too bulky for me most of the time. But awesome, awesome stuff. I think it's great to keep investing. Uh, a follow focus is great. I, I'm gonna make a whole video about this Nucleus Nano follow focus rig that I have. I've made it in the past, but I have some updates to it that are exciting I wanna share with you guys. Um, Davidson says, I saw you have Rokinon Cine lenses. Have you tried the Zine version? Yeah, so I have, like you said, pretty much the entire, not the entire lineup, but almost all of the Rokinon Cine DS lenses. Um, I really like them. Obviously they're really affordable. They're pretty sharp. They get really wide open at T1.5 for almost all of them. And I have tried the Zine lenses. I don't own any of them, but I have used them on a couple different shoots. They're really nice. They have a really um, full metal build to them, um, which is nice. Just like the Pictor Zooms where it has that full metal um, housing around the lens. Um, so these are the Pictor Zooms, it's not the Zines, but it feels like them. It feels just like them, really nice premium, and they have a good look to them. I wouldn't say that they look drastically different from the Rokinons, though. So it's, it's kind of a hard thing to say. I don't think, 
at this point in my career that I would buy the zines from the Rokinons just because I know my image quality isn't going to change that much. I would probably save up and buy a little bit nicer or different lenses than the zines personally because I think the Rokinon video quality or uh, like image quality is so similar. And talking to the engineers at Rokinon, they basically have said, yes, the glass is the same, but it has slightly different coatings. And then the housing is different, obviously, on them. They have a full metal housing that's larger. So the image quality isn't that much different. There's just some slight different coatings, but the glass is essentially the same. Yeah, so I want to keep going on all of your guys' comments and questions. Keep them coming, but I want to keep on this topic as well. Stay on track as much as I can. Um, talking about, you know, why don't you just buy a cinema camera? So one huge advantage of mirrorless and DSLR cameras is the fact that they're just so much smaller, right? You can't break down a cinema camera like the Sony um, FS7 Mark II or the new FX6 or F9 any smaller than, you know, yay big. They don't get smaller. <laughs> it's impossible, right? But a mirrorless camera has the great image quality that you want usually, I mean, depending on which one it is, but it can get so much smaller. So if you need to throw it on a gimbal, like many of us do frequently, you can do that. You can break off all of the handles and monitors and V-mount batteries. Hopefully you have everything kind of like on natal rails so you can quickly take it apart or whatever, but you can break it down, throw it on a gimbal. You can't do that with a cinema camera. If you wanna throw it onto a gimbal, you need a big gimbal like the Ronin 2 or the Movi Pro. Obviously, there are other gimbals as well. Those are some of the most popular ones that can hold large ones. Like we've done shoots with the Canon C300 Mark II with that on set with the full Movi and it is extremely heavy with all of the rigging on it. Running around with that is not easy. That's a heavy rig. Um, and it's just really, really expensive too. The gimbals that can hold cinema cameras are like $5,000 and above. So, yeah, if I was like, hey, I'm gonna buy a cinema camera, okay, you're moving into a range where now you've gotta spend even that much more just on support because let's say you do that, you gotta upgrade your gimbal now and you probably gotta upgrade your tripod because your tripod can only support a certain amount of weight. Like if you're using a fluid video head, it's gonna just flop forward. If it's too heavy, you need a bigger, bulkier one like a, a satchler or whatever it is, you're gonna need a nicer tripod now if you end up buying the cinema camera. So that's a huge thing right there. Just the size difference alone makes a huge difference for me when you can buy that DSLR. It's a little bit more of like kind of the Swiss army knife, right? of cameras that can be rigged out fully to look and perform more like a cinema camera, have the functions that you need, and then also break down and have the functions and advantages of a small camera. So that's kind of my take on that portion of it. So let me know, do you guys agree? If you do, smash the like button. Um, I would love to see that like button just bloop, 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 bloop up, whereas only 10 people have liked it right now. That is sad. There's more of you guys watching. So hit the like button. Right, let's get back into some questions here. I want to make sure that I catch them all. So, uh, Quippy's channel, I um, hope I'm saying that right, says, hey there, Chad, um, what do you think of the rumored FX3? Yeah, I just saw that today. That looks pretty cool, pretty crazy. I want to pull it up on the live stream if I can for anyone that hasn't seen this yet. I mean, this just looks really interesting. Let's see if I can get this pulled up here. Pretty interesting stuff, guys. So here we go, Sony FX3. I know we're going on a little bit of tangent here, but if this is real, which it probably is, because anytime there are leaked photos like this, especially in someone's literal hand, um, yeah, that's that's real. I love that it says Cinema Line FX3. Like, what? Oh, that's exciting stuff. I mean, really exciting stuff. To me, this looks like the competitor to Canon's C70. I mean, Sony keeps punching back. Canon releases something and Sony's like, nah, nah, nah. Boom, punches back with something better. Well, I don't know, That's it's subjective, I know. The Canon-Sony battle is consistent, but it's pretty interesting to see that difference there. So, um, but yeah, so back, back to the Cine line, the FX3 Sony, getting on a bit of a tangent here, but this is kind of a mashup. Um, I think it's really interesting. So obviously they got rid of the viewfinder, um, just like the Pocket 6K doesn't have a viewfinder. The Pocket 4K doesn't have that viewfinder. And it just has that gray body, similar to the FX6 and FX9. And it's all very squared off, which I think is cool. 
Um, but I'm interested to see the specs on it. I know people are rumoring there's 8K or you know a handful of different specs, and I'm really interested to see if any of those are true. But I love that it has that flip out screen, so you're still getting kind of that those cinema line qualities. Uh, and hopefully they put like I think it's Sony Cine S Tone in there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but hopefully they put that in there so you get that really nice um, color science and skin tones, but still with a flip out screen and that huge record button on top. If this is real, I love that. I think, man, I just think it's really cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, short answer. I'm excited. I'm excited to see if it's real, uh, you know, when it comes out and the price point and the features and capabilities of it. And if it's full frame. I mean, obviously no one can tell from this, but I'm assuming that it's full frame and then it's not a crop sensor. Um, I don't know, I could be wrong. I can't tell actually what lens this is on there. I think this is a, one of the Sony full frame ones. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's like a full frame little cine cam. I like that they've kind of gone with a more boxy style, but yeah, that's exciting stuff. Can't say for sure. It's all speculative right now, but Pretty cool. Hopefully, hopefully something really fun comes out of that camera. I would love to get my hands on it if it's real and review it. I know nothing. Sony sends me no information. I don't know anything before any of you guys do, unfortunately. So, all right, back to a couple questions. Um, let's see. Um, TJ Digital says. Um, cinema camera doesn't have ND built in, um, camera, why pocket four key need ND in body camera. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I, okay. I see what you're saying. So yeah, that's correct. Not all cinema cameras have variable NDs built, built into them. You're totally right. Um, you know, black, uh, let's see, like red, red cameras, not all the red cameras have, NDs built into them. All the Aries don't have ND filters built into them. You're totally correct there. Um, I will say that it's it's not 100% necessary. I usually throw a map box in the front of my lens and you know put variable NDs in there. I did a whole review just recently on the Polar Pro map box with their new mist filters, which are just so cool. Um, so yeah, it's not totally necessary. I'd say that it's very convenient. Anytime I'm shooting on a cinema camera at the studio that I work at, it's obviously so nice to just whoop, flip on an ND. You don't have to go grab anything and put it on there. You can just flip it on like that or off. So it's super convenient, but no, not necessary for all of them. Um, all right, so yeah, keep going here. Uh, Bro Brody Warrell he says, hi, I'm starting a YouTube channel. What camera do you recommend? Whew, that's a hard one. It just depends on your budget, dude. But just off the top of my head, I would say probably go with the Sony A6600. Um, that's a great camera to start with that is relatively affordable and it has fantastic autofocus uh, and that sort of thing. So the Sony A6600, you know, 1400 bucks body only. I mean, obviously if you need to get a lens, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive if you go with, you know, whatever lens you want. But that's a great camera to start with. Um, the video that I'm shooting right now with you guys live streaming is the Sony a6500. So right, one of the predecessors to it. And it's a great camera for autofocus. So if you're doing YouTube, you need autofocus to be able to, you know, do this sort of talking head stuff. Um, I manual, I always manually focus when I'm on set with a client, right? So this is a fully manual, um, you know, cinema lens with no electronic connections. And I have the follow focus on there from Nucleus Nano. Um, and everything's set up. And so I always prefer manual focus when I'm behind the camera. But when I'm in front of the camera right now with the lens, I prefer something with decent autofocus. And I think the Sony a6600 is just really great there. Great battery life, um, everything like that. So I think that's a great starting camera. If you wanna go cheaper, maybe do the a6400. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, it's totally up to you. Depends on your budget, depends on you know, if you have any lenses already to start to go to, um, to add to it, maybe you, you want to do a Canon one or a Fuji or whatever it is. Um, there's just a lot of great ones, maybe the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, but I don't think that's the best camera for filming yourself when you're doing YouTube videos and for like quicker stuff where you need out of focus. Uh, yeah. So hopefully that, hopefully that helps, man. I just think that's a good camera to start with for YouTube. All right. So Let's see what else is going on here. Trying to trying to keep up. 
Uh, Santi Romero says your voice is soothing. Thanks. I don't know. I don't know. I get that sometimes. I don't, I don't feel like it is. I feel like my voice is, can be annoying, but maybe, maybe it is. I like that. So, um, let's see. TJ says, forget the all tool you need is one body camera. Never buy that. Isn't good quality Buy separately. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're talking about buying the camera versus buying um, the camera and the lens together. Can't say for sure. Uh, let's see. Chris Polk says, I've been looking at spider and peak holsters clips at $50 plus and thinking there's got to be some kind of a V clip in the video world that could be adapted to a belt clip for flashes or lens pouches. Hmm. That's a good question. I'm not totally sure. I'm not, I don't think I'm the aficionado on that. I think you're talking about like quick release stuff for putting um, like lenses and flashes like actually mounted on your body. I don't do photography really. I don't, I, I do just for like getting thumbnails and for fun and with my family and friends and that sort of thing um, and traveling, but I don't do photography really professionally unless a client absolutely needs it. Um, I'll snap some photos, but um, I know there's a bunch of great stuff. I know Peak Design has all different things, you know, for quick releasing clips and cameras and things on and off and lenses and stuff. So sorry, I can't give too much more advice there. Um, I wish I could for you, but um, I'm sure there's really good good stuff if you just check on YouTube, just go literally Google search what you're looking for and I'm sure it's there. Um, Let's see, Robert Frampton says, it's really not practical to run and gun with a cinema camera with a DSLR and mirrorless, you're shooting in seconds. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's definitely truth to, there's some truth to that. Um, with a DSLR camera, they power up usually a lot quicker. You know, I can get the Pocket 6K to turn on within a few seconds. I mean, I'm gonna try and flip it on here. Let's see, one, two, three. That was maybe three seconds max and it's, it's, it's up, it's ready to roll. Um, the red Komodo seen a ton of stuff on that and it's about a minute boot time, 30 seconds, I think 30 seconds to a minute boot time, which is a long time. And you could miss the shot. I've had moments where I'm out shooting. I mean, like probably dozens of moments where I'm like, Oh crap, I need this. I need to get this. This is a great moment or I'm going to miss this action where I'm flipping the camera on and trying to get as quick as I can. Or I'm like, Oh, I got to change this setting really quick. And I need to be able to get it with within under a minute. Like it's like something that I need to grab within the next 30 seconds. So waiting for that cine cam to power cycle up and be ready to shoot can be a problem. Make you miss a shot for sure. Um, but depending on, but depending on how that cinema camera is rigged out and what it is, I can definitely run and gun with it. I've done a lot of shoots with the Sony FS5 and the FS7 Mark II. Where I'm just running around with that top handle and that little monitor and just framing up and getting what I need totally handheld. Um, you can definitely run and gun with it. I mean, the news runs and guns with big, you know, I don't know. It depends on what you call running and gunning, obviously, but I think it's possible. Um, a DSLR is obviously much more lightweight, much more nimble um, uh, and easier to work with in that sense of size than a Cinecam, but... Yeah, there's advantages and disadvantages to both for sure. Uh, let's see. Brett Putman says, what's up first off? He says, uh, mirrorless camera and cinema cameras both have their place. I use an EOS R and a Ninja V for product video work and it rules. Still using the Pocket 4K um, for client work in the field. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that they definitely have their places. When you are doing client work, it's really nice to be behind the camera pulling focus manually and just being able to set things up the way that you want. But when you need to work really quickly, that sort of thing, it's nice to have the advantages of a DSLR or mirrorless camera and autofocus and everything like that. So yeah, I can totally agree. All right. Um, I want to keep going down the line here on a couple of these topics of, you know, why don't you just buy a cinema camera, dude? Keep rigging them out. Why don't you just buy one? We already talked about price. We've talked about size. Um, one big thing, um, is that, you know, obviously I talked about how you can transfer over all the parts from one rig to the next one. It's easy to do that with rigging out. But there's a couple other things that where, you know, a cinema camera has its advantages and why maybe you could buy a cinema camera um, as opposed to just buying the mirrorless. One of them that we already mentioned was, you know, having the built-in ND filters. Uh, but another one is that, a lot of times there's those built-in XLRs, right? So if you need to do professional audio where you have full XLR inputs, 
you have that advantage on a cinema camera where just on the mirrorless, you don't have the ability to do that. A lot of times it's just a three and a half millimeter jack or a mini XLR like you get on the Pocket 6K, but still I gotta use an adapter to be able to plug in. So that's one of those points where, hey, you know what? There are times frequently when I'm shooting professional client work where I need two microphones and most cinema cameras have two XLR inputs and boom, boom, I can plug in two mics, I'm good to go, I'm up, I'm running immediately. And I love that, I do. And all of the little abilities to just adjust the gain on the outside of the camera with dials and turn up that gain or down, whatever it is, is obviously really convenient with cinema cameras. Um, something else besides the audio inputs, the ND filters, is that most cinema cameras have a larger battery solution as well. So like we talked about, most mirrorless cameras, you're getting shoot times on the Pocket 6K of 20 minutes and on some of some of like the Sony cameras or Canon cameras, you might be getting 30 minutes, maybe an hour, some of them a little bit more depending on the battery life of that camera. But with some cinema cameras, you get those BP batteries or some of them that just have a direct V-mount battery on the back and then you're talking about hours of battery life. You're talking about three hours, four hours, um, that sort of thing of really good battery life. And it doesn't require any extra rigging. Like here, you know, I have the 15 millimeter rods, I have a little tilt base plate on the back here. And then I have one of the small little um, Yin Chem V-mount batteries that I can just slide onto the back and get long battery life because it's all, you know, D-tap plugs into the side right here of the Pocket 6K, and now I can run for a couple hours on this rig. I can power the follow focus, I can power my monitor if I want to, I can power wireless follow focus, all that's there, but of course I had to add that to the rig. And that, you know, that costs more money, but with a cinema camera, you may not have to add all that rigging because there's just a spot to put a V-mount, or you can add a little module directly to the back that plugs in perfectly to some of them. They have like a V-mount expansion kit to them. so. That's, that's definitely one advantage of the cinema cameras is you're probably gonna have better battery life. All right, let's get back to a couple of the comments here. You guys just keep keep commenting, keep the questions coming, I love that. So I wanna make sure I get back to all of them. Um, let's see, Aomagots, <laughs> hopefully I'm saying that right, says, what do you think of the BGH1? You know what, I haven't done much research on it. Um, I don't think I have a really good answer for you right now. I think it's exciting. The BGH-1 is um, Panasonic's new like little square body camera that is Netflix approved apparently. So let's see if I can pull it up for those of you watching that aren't super familiar. So I'll do a little screen share here. There we go. So there's the Panasonic Lumix BGH-1 Cinema 4K box camera. I like how they call it the box camera. This is funny. Everyone's asking, I want more square bodies because we like, you know, rigging them up and we like that kind of look and feel of a red, right? Obviously, Z-Cam has done this almost exact same style. The powder goes in the back, red Komodo. It's a really popular style right now. Even Blackmagic already has a little camera like this, the micro cam, right? Um, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, obviously, like it's claiming here, 13 stops of dynamic range, which is good. 4K, 422, all those are really good things. And it's exciting that it's a Netflix approved camera. I think that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure why this is approved, whereas there's so many other cameras that aren't. Like the Pocket 6K is not a Netflix approved camera. Why is this one? I would love to know their thinking behind that. But no, I think it looks interesting. Um, I wanted to pull up the Blackmagic Micro camera really quick because I don't think it gets enough attention. Um, it's, it's interesting because it has the little box design and they did this years before a lot of the other guys. Um, everyone's always asking for that little kind of square design and Blackmagic has already done it. They did it a while ago uh, with this, but it just doesn't have all the features you want. It's a micro four thirds. So the sensor size, obviously not as sensitive to light. It's not going to give you as nice a shallow depth of field, but I do think it's interesting, um, it's only 1200 bucks. Just um, <laughs> thought that was interesting. It looks a lot like the other one, the BGH1. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think it's something worth checking out. Maybe in the future, I'll get my hands on that camera and do some testing. Haven't been able to do anything with it yet, obviously, but I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what kind of images come out of it. I hope they're nice. All right, so good, good question though. Let's see, Scott Morgison says, not crazy about Sony colors unless it's in S Cinetone. Yeah, so 
Um, I have not had the advantage of shooting an S Cine tone yet. I would love to. Um, been shooting on Sony cameras for a long time. The Sony FS7 Mark II, the FS5 Mark II, the new A7S III, but none of those yet had a cine tone. It's just the most recent ones, the FX6, FX9, so on that have that cine tone. So I would love to try it out, see how it looks. You know, though, I will say with the Sony A7S III, I was impressed with the colors coming out of it. You guys can check out the videos that I've done, the reviews on the Sony A7S III on my channel. And I think that the colors ended up looking pretty good um, they definitely corrected their color science much beyond some of their earlier models. They've been improving that color science, but I would love to, to test out S Cine tone. There's been a lot of great reviews of it. So yeah, I mean, that's cool. You've, you've been, had some good experience with it. All right. Um, Brett Petman says, what do you think will be the next black magic release? People are saying a full frame pocket. Yeah, man, I don't know. Black magic. I, I said this in the last, um, I think I said this in one of the last live streams, Black Magic reached out to me uh, a week or two ago and was saying, hey, like, you know, we've seen some of your videos and we just kind of started chatting. Um, but yeah, they told me nothing. <laughs> they won't, I don't think they're going to tell me anything. They're like, hey, well, we'll keep you up to date on any, you know, of our news news announcements or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I'll find out when, I'll, when everyone else finds out. I don't have any good insider information on that. And they don't leak anything ever. It's always like... Phew hush hush kind of kind of like apple but apple seems to be getting worse and worse at keeping things secret there's too many people in the company things keep leaking but yeah i will say that a full frame camera from black magic would definitely be interesting everything's been you know um the smaller crop sensors and micro four thirds for a while they don't have any full frame so it would definitely be really nice to have um, but if you watched my last live stream and my last video all about these lenses, I don't think that I'm going to be doing much full frame work right now because full frame is just not offering the cinema lenses that I want and definitely not at an affordable price point. So I want to be shooting from now on as much as possible on cinema lenses. So the Pictor zooms, you know, you have the 50 to 125 here, but it only covers a crop sensor. And then right here, the 20 to 55 Pictor Zoom Cinema Lens T 2.8, so great, gets nice and wide open. Only covers a crop sensor, unfortunately. Um, so if I were to get this new hypothetical Blackmagic full-frame camera, I wouldn't be able to use my nice Cinema lenses on it, and that would be a big bummer for me. So right now, full-frame is not really on my list of things that I'm trying to target. The lenses are too expensive. Um, and they're like when, especially when I'm talking about the cinema lenses, even the stills lenses are much more expensive. Like a full frame, uh, lens is about twice the price of a crop sensor lens. So don't get me wrong. I used to be an absolute full frame aficionado, like full frame or die, you know, like full frame or nothing kind of guy for a bit there with the Sony a7S, a7S II. Um, obviously I just re reviewed the a7S III and it's great. I love it to death, but I really wish the lenses would catch up and be more affordable when it comes to the cinema lenses and availability. So yeah, I just, I don't think that I'll be getting that right now, but I love, I love the idea of, you know, that, that being a possibility from black magic, that would be really cool. All right. Um, great question. going to keep, keep going down here, try and keep up. Uh, let's see here. Where did I leave off? Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm, there's just like too many things I'm trying to keep up. All right. Okay, Winter Mute, talking about the lens um, on the new Sony A-X3 or whatever the heck it's called, is saying uh, uh, that they think there's a, I think that there's a G lens on there that says FE on the top. So they think it's a full frame lens um, in the picture of that little new camera that was leaked today. Um, yeah, hopefully it is. I can't tell. Let's see. Cello Gaming says Black Magic is good for note, not for solo filmmaking. I need autofocus and at least a tilt screen. Gotcha. Not okay. Yeah, exactly. The the Pocket 4K, the Pocket 6K is not the best camera when it comes to just filming yourself. So if you do a lot of talking head YouTubey stuff like this, um, not the camera that I'd be reaching for first. Definitely right there. Um, Adam Majit Singh has. Posted 12 times. Uh, should I buy the the Blackmagic 6K or wait till this release? 
Um, totally up to you. It's hard to say. There's always going to be a new camera. I mean, 2020, um, for all that it was, was the year of amazing cameras, right? So many new releases constantly. So should you buy the Pocket 6K? If you think it's something that you need right now, go, excuse me, go for it. It's hard to say and wait. Hey, just wait for this, wait for that. There's always going to be a new camera. There's always going to be something that you're like, wow, that looks incredible. That's impressive. Um, so I would say if you have the money to do it and you've been wanting to do that, go for it. And if, if it turns out there's another one, you know, you can sell it and get the next one. I, I, I'm kind of cycle through cameras as they upgrade. I don't do it like extremely frequently, but I definitely do. Um, let's see. It's me. Razin says, is the Blackmagic 4.6K G2 a good option? Yes, it's a great um, it's a great cinema camera, good quality image coming out of there and a good price point. It's definitely one of the cheapest like cinema cameras that you can buy. So yeah, I, I would say for sure. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I'm like talking this much gets me really, really thirsty. So I'm just constantly drinking water or my Mountain Dew uh, for caffeine. So sorry. All right. Um, let's see here. Hanson Choice says still rocking an A7 II. Uh, misses a lot when I'm using the 24 to 70 G master. I shoot 70% photo, 30% video. I really like the color and low light performance on the S3. Um, should I still buy it or wait for the R5? Yeah, if it were me um, and you're doing primarily photography, then yeah, you could probably go with the new R5 or maybe you don't have to wait for that. You could get an R4. It's totally up to you. Um, it sounds like you're doing a lot more photography and obviously the R lineup is much better for photography. You have much higher resolution, you know, 50 megapixels and that sort of thing. Whereas with the A7S lineup, you're still only getting 12 megapixels, which just is not a lot. But as you guys are well aware of, I'm sure it only has 12 megapixels because it makes it more sensitive to low light because it has larger photo sites on the sensor that can be much bigger and gather more light. So all those little teeny photo sites, those little pixels squished together on something like the R4, R5 are less sensitive to light because they're so small. So um, yeah, it's up to you though. I, I think either of them is a great option, but it sounds like you, you do more photography. Um, it's me, Razin says Canon M50 is also a very good option. Yeah, if you're talking about starting with, um, you know, a camera for YouTube, Canon M50 is a great way to go. I totally agree. Uh, let's see. Maurice Williams, what's up? He says, have you tried any of the Siri anamorphic lenses? I have not. I've talked about this on the channel a little bit before in the past. Um, I would love to get my hands on the Siri anamorphics and just kind of test them out. I've been in talks with them a little bit to just try and test one out, but hasn't happened yet. My biggest problem with the Siri anamorphics is that they're only a 1.33 squeeze, which I don't want to go too deep in this, but if you're familiar with the anamorphics, um, the most common squeeze and best looking squeeze is a two times squeeze, which means that that bokeh and the image and everything like that, the blurred out areas are going to look really interesting and different um, and more compressed. Whereas with a 1.33 squeeze, it doesn't actually look super anamorphic. The biggest anamorphic characteristic out of the series is the lens flare. Um, but I think it can be a little bit too dramatic sometimes that really like just massive blue lens flare that's just like always screams sci-fi <laughs> every time it screams Star Trek. Um, and, I, and I love lens flares, but that's the biggest part of the anamorphic quality of the Siri lenses more than like the actual like squeeze of the image. Um, I think it's really exciting what they're doing. I think it's really, really great. It's it's honestly a really good thing what Siri is doing. They're bringing anamorphic lenses into an affordable place for indie filmmakers and videographers and other companies will follow suit. They always do. The market, the market puts something out and then the rest of the market responds to that. So Rokinon and other companies may eventually come out with their um, own lineup of anamorphic lenses. So yeah, I think it's a good thing what they're doing. It's going to help the market bring more anamorphic lenses to us filmmakers and hopefully some that have a two times squeeze or at least a 1.8 squeeze like you get out of the basins. I'd love to try them out, but I don't think I'll be buying any anytime soon. That's just, it's not enough anamorphic for me. I'll just stick with spherical for now um, until there's some better, more affordable um, anamorphics. All right. Uh, let's see. Robert Frantum says, agreed on the A6600, it's hard to beat in its price range. Absolutely. I think it's the best APS-C crop sensor camera that you can buy from Sony. So absolutely. 
Um, let's see. Adam Majit says, should I buy Pocket 6K or wait till the, the release? Okay, I'm just posting that again. <laughs> um, Mr. De Kopdal says, A7S is the best. It's a great camera. Um, shot with it for a long time. Still shoot with it sometimes at the studio. It's a very good camera. So many great advantages to it. Um, all right. So Davidson says, by the way, I asked about the zine lenses because I love the design of it. I'm afraid it's too heavy for the rig I want. Fuji X-T4, Metabone Speed Booster, but still want to try. Yeah, Davidson, um, the zine lenses are massive. Like they're huge. If you get their standard ones, um, like their original release, they are huge. Um, and you can't tell from the photos usually because you just can't see, you can't like gauge um, size very well. But if you actually put it onto a camera like the X-T4, you'll be surprised they are really big. So here we go. Here's the original Zines um, the metal body. And when you actually see this mounted on a smaller camera, like a Sony a6500 or something like the Fuji X-T4, you're like, whoa, that's a big lens on a little camera. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard to balance on a gimbal. I will say it's possible. People do it. Um, I was able to balance this lens. It's way longer than the Zine lenses on a gimbal. I was able to balance it on the Crane 2S with my X-T4. So it's possible. Uh, it's, it's about a similar weight as well, but they're big. They definitely are. It's hard to tell just looking at the pictures. Um, if you want to try it out, um, you know, maybe there's a rental house locally that has it. Maybe on one of your next paid shoots, you can convince them to rent some cinema lenses and then you can try it out. Try it out and see see how you like it. Um, yeah, that's what I would do before you buy them. Try it out and see what you can find. But you can find these lenses used now for quite a bit cheaper. You can find them for like 1200 bucks to maybe 1500 for one. It's, you know, it's not super cheap, but you can find them used for a little bit better of a price. All right, um... Let's see here. The Orlando guy says, hmm, you're streaming in 720p. Yeah, so that's what they recommend. YouTube like won't let me stream in 1080p. I mean, maybe other guys can, but yeah, I try to put it in 1080p, but it doesn't let you do it. It just boop, downgrades to 720p, so <laughs> I don't get why, but I that's what it does, and I and I have good internet speed too, um, and obviously, you know, could put this in 4K, but it, it won't let you stream in 4K, so... It's unfortunate. That's what's funny about getting these cameras. Like, oh yeah, man, I got the 6K camera. It's like, yeah, well, guess what? Everyone's watching your stuff back in 720p on their phone or lower, maybe 380p or whatever, 360p, whatever it is that it defaults to on Facebook and stuff like that. Just like a really crappy low quality. That's what's funny is all these cameras are going up and up and up in resolution. I've talked about this before. They're going 6K, we're going 8K. Blackmagic is like, bruh we're going 12k and you're just like oh my gosh there aren't even freaking tvs and phones that are handling 6k right now or 12k or 8k or 4k let alone for that half the time but obviously we know the advantages of shooting in higher resolution obviously crop in blah 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 all the good stuff but it's just funny it's just funny Let's, let's just laugh at ourselves for a little bit we want more resolution but we're not even watching stuff back at the highest resolutions it's just funny. All right. Um, let's see here. Robert Harazzo says, I am between the S5 Lumix and the Fujifilm X-T4 and the EOS R6. Yeah, man. Um, that's a hard toss-up and all completely different mounts. What lenses do you have the most of? That's what I would That's what I would go off of. What lenses, which mount do you have the most of? Fujifilm, you know, do you have a bunch of X mount? Do you have Canon EF mount? Um, just depends. And the Lumix is its L mount, I believe. You know, it just depends on what you have. And I will say, I've looked at, you know, the Panasonic Lumix S5 because it really has some great advantages to it. You know, you're getting full frame and you're getting ProRes RAW, which is awesome. But the lens lineup just wasn't very good and you're adapting everything. Obviously, you can, excuse me, you can adapt just about any lens. For the most part, you can adapt lenses around. Um, but that would be a good deciding factor, I would say, is look at the lenses that you have and see what's going to work well for you. So you don't have to sell off or buy all new lenses. Um, all right. Sinful Spectrum says, I'm here to ask any question. I'm here to say that you are such an underrated gem of YouTube. Keep doing what you do. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, absolutely. It's fun to hang out with you guys and do this sort of thing. So I appreciate that. Guys, if you've been enjoying this live stream, smash the like button right now, by the way. There's 72 people watching and we're at 31 likes. If everyone hits like right now, we're going to be looking beautiful. So go ahead and smash it. Um, Cello Gaming says Panasonic S5 is very good, but to get the reliable autofocus, you should use native Lumix S lenses. It's very expensive. Yeah, that's what I was just talking about. You're way ahead of me. I know I'm like catching up to the chat slowly, but yes, you got to change all your lenses if you're going to be doing the Lumix and you want it to be native. It's expensive to do that. I love adapting lenses. I've talked about this before, but almost everything I have is Canon EF mount. I chose to go all Canon EF mount and buy all my Cine DS like Rokinon lenses in Canon EF mount because it is the most adaptable lens on planet earth. I mean, PL mount a lot of times gets that notion of being super like, Ooh, it's PL everyone. It's universal, but it's not really when it comes to these mirrorless and DSLR cameras. Uh, the great thing about EF mount, just a little science lesson for you guys here. You probably already know this, but with Canon EF, there's something called flange distance, right? So how close is the lens to the actual sensor? Well, with Canon EF, it needs to be further away from the lens because it was built to have space with a mirror. So when you had to have a mirror in there, because DSLRs obviously used to have mirrors, um, you had to have space for that. They had to allot for that so that the image could hit the mirror and then bounce up to the sensor that was above. Uh, and that's how they built all of them. But now with mirrorless cameras, they don't need that space. So they're just building them right up against the sensor. Um, so there's no way for it to be adapted because there's no gap. But when you have Canon EF lenses, there's still that flange distance. There's still that gap between the lens and the sensor. So it gives you the ability to build an adapter to make it go to whatever you want. So you can go Canon EF to uh, Sony E mount. You can go to the Lumix L mount. You can go to, uh, you know, whatever it is. You can go to Micro Four Thirds mount because there's that space in between to allow for an adapter. But if you buy all Sony E mount lenses, right, those will mount directly to the mirrorless camera and there ain't no space to put an adapter in there. You can't put a Sony E mount lens onto a Canon camera. It's literally physically impossible. So that's why I invested in all Canon EF lenses. And I think I will for the very persistent future. <laughs> Let me know. What do you guys think? Do you have Canon EF lenses? Am I crazy? Um, obviously, I buy some native lenses for the autofocus like I have here. Um, but other than that, when I'm actually operating the camera, I'm not using autofocus. And I want to be able to adapt my lenses to whatever camera I upgrade to in the future. So I'm always trying to future proof and buy lenses that will follow me along my journey. All right. Um, let's see. Robert Harazo says he's got the Sigma 24 to 70. Yeah. I used to have uh, same lens, the good lens, good, good, you know, range there. Um, yeah. It sounds like a bunch of people have it saying, Oh yeah, I got that too. Um, champ champagne sumo says, which is better a cage or a gimbal? That's a weird question. <laughs> They're totally different. Uh, buy a cage first. Uh, it's cheaper. You're going to get one from 50 to hundred bucks. Probably buy a gimbal next. Um, they're totally different products and it depends on what you want to do. Are you, do you want to build it out like this, put a top handle and make it a handheld rig and you do handheld shooting Then yeah, get a cage. That's the right option for you. But if you don't, and you want to do a lot of gimbal work, then you don't necessarily need a cage on the gimbal, but I love cages. It's the first, it's the ground. It's the base that I build everything up off of. So I'd buy the cage first. Uh, let's see. Robert Horazzo says, I'm thinking about the Codex X-T4 is MP4, um, but S5 is compressed. That's a big deal. Um, yeah, I'm not sure behind all of that, but basically for me, when I'm shooting, I'm attaching the Atomos Ninja V to the X-T4 and shooting in ProRes because it edits back the absolute most smoothly on my computer. So I don't usually shoot internally on the X-T4, although sometimes I do. Um, I don't usually because it shoots in the H.265 codec, which is really hard on my computer. I have an older iMac 2013 sitting in front of me. It's time to upgrade this thing eventually, but uh, ProRes RAW still edits beautifully on this computer. So on the S5, I would do the same thing. I would shoot in ProRes. All right. Um, let's see. 
Uh, yeah, David said, says, I think you should try before deciding. He's talking about the zine lenses. Yeah, definitely try before you buy if you can. Some rental houses will let you come in and even do testing with their lenses, with their cameras. You could call them up and say, hey, I see you have this. I'd love to test this out. Can I come down and test it out? And some of them are cool like that and let you do that. Um, uh, Jaime Ibanez says, I just bought an FS5, but I kind of find myself going back to the Lumix G85 because I know that camera more. Yeah, I've shot a ton on the FS5. I was shooting on the FS5 and F FS5 Mark II today um, in the studio, plenty. Um, it's a good camera. It has a lot of the features built into it that I, that I need. I've made a whole review of it on this channel um, for other people if they want to check it out. But yeah, there's something about the familiarity of a camera. I remember, you know, I haven't always been shooting on cinema cameras. There was a point when I didn't know cameras very well. And I was really familiar with like the Sony a7S lineup, but I wasn't familiar with the Sony FS5, the FS7 Mark II. And I was on a shoot for PetSmart. We were shooting a little commercial with, you know, cute little dogs and gerbils and things like that. And I was just trying to change the ISO and I couldn't even figure out how to do it. I was like, um yeah, how do I do this? And I was asking someone else, I was working with a coworker, wait, how do you change this on here? Like, I can't figure it out. I just want to shoot this on the A7S, uh, A7S. It's so much easier. I know how to do it. I can make it look good. Um, so yeah, so there's a learning curve, obviously, once you switch over to a cinema camera and you have to learn where everything's at, the menus, the buttons and stuff. But once you get it set up, you can get really quick on it. I mean, there are times when we're shooting something and I'm like, oh, got to change that real quick. I mean, you guys are the same way. So yeah, it's funny though. Um, all right, trying to trying to keep up here. The comments just like bounce down for me and want to make sure I'm not missing something. All right. Um, wow. Okay. You guys are just like blowing past me in the comments. I got to, I got to catch up guys. I'm sorry. All right. Um, Ambrose Gardner. What's up? He says, cool shirt. Thank you. <laughs> I've been wearing a ton of into the AM shirts on this channel recently. You guys can check them out not sponsored, just like their stuff. He says, um, what's your favorite director's monitor cage that you've used in the past? Yeah, so uh, I don't have a director's monitor cage like on all of the monitors that I use, but right now I have the Ninja V that I use sometimes as, you know, maybe as a director's monitor. And that just has, I believe the NITS cage on it, N-I-T-Z-E, I think it is. I have to go look at it again, but just a simple little monitor, nothing Nothing crazy or intricate there. Small rig, of course, makes little um, rigs, um, cages for those that are nice. Any any of them will work. It's just metal, so not a huge deal there. Um, yeah, we, we touched on this earlier, but Edgar um, Nates is saying, does the Pocket 6K count as a cinema camera? Uh, I don't want to get beat up by all the, the Blackmagic fanboys, myself included, but I would, I would venture to say it's not a traditional cinema camera. Um, it's, it's, it's a hybrid of a cinema camera. It's much more in the mirrorless world. Um, there are some features that make it kind of a cinema camera, like the, the flat picture profiles and you know the usability that it's just set up to shoot video and not photo. That makes it more cinema camera centric, but I would say it's much more in the mirrorless realm. I wouldn't quite say it's a cinema, like a professional cinema camera by any means. I've shot on a ton of normal cinema cameras. This is nothing like that. Um, Jaime says, hola, buenos noches. Yes, it's a good night here. It's nine o'clock where I'm at. Welcome. I wish I spoke Spanish. Sorry, I probably just butchered that. Um, Robert says, I'm in Colombia. Um, there's no rental houses here, so I can't find the X-T4. Yeah, or the S5. Yeah, I mean, I know it's, it's a lot harder in some of the foreign countries to get things. And I, I take that for advantage, like I take that for granted too often. Um, that here we, you know, here in the States, it's much easier to find those rental houses. So hopefully you can find maybe a friend or get onto like a Facebook group locally, just like an XT4 Facebook groups and maybe message someone on there that is around you and see if they can hang out and they wanna go do a little photo shoot or video shoot with you and they can show you their camera and you can test it out. There's a great community online of guys that love to go out and, you know, do little projects and stuff together. So that might be worth trying out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what's up? Okay. Avatar Media says best budget cinema rig in your opinion. Best budget cinema rig. That's hard. Um, I mean, there, I don't really have like a budget cinema rig in itself. Everything's custom to the camera and what little parts and pieces that I do. I would say go check out previous videos on my channel of rigging out the Sony a7S III, the most recent one that I did. 
that has like my favorite parts right now for a cinema rig and a lot of them are on the pocket 6k that i have in front of me um sony a1 thoughts says sloan treats yeah the sony a1 is not going to be a camera that i'm going to be buying anytime soon i think it's interesting but i think it's way too expensive for what it is um i just it's not a great video camera like for for us if you're going to drop sixty five hundred dollars um it's too much right it's it's like sixty five hundred dollars and you're still just have a mirrorless camera with limitations no full-size xlr inputs no uh you know built-in nds good like giant battery life source you're not getting any of that um for sixty five hundred dollars sixty five hundred dollars you can get the sony fx6 um which i would absolutely buy over this i think the a1 has its place it's great for photography um, obviously it's for like sports photographers, action, that kind of stuff. Um, but I just don't think it's meant for videographers. Like most of us that are watching this, if you're going to spend that kind of money buy the FX six, this thing's incredible, pretty much has the exact same sensor as the Sony a seven S three, but it has all these nice built in features. And man, I'll tell you what, when you're working on a cinema camera like this, it is so nice to have all of these things just built right into the side to quickly make changes. I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's like, oh, I need to change my white balance. Guess what? There's buttons for it right here. And there's presets, ISO, shutter, all those things built in right there onto the side of the camera. It just makes it so quick to get to them. Um, whereas, you know, with these DSLR and mirrorless cameras, you got to dig through the menus and, and float around in there. But having these actual hard buttons to just quickly change the thing is it's definitely really nice to have. I will say that. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you guys are getting some good value out of this. I know that we've been talking a lot about all different pieces of gear and equipment, um, but hopefully it's been uh, you know, helpful with, you know, why, why I don't just buy a cinema camera. I want to make sure that I nail that back home to you guys. Um, I haven't just gone out and bought a cinema camera because there are so many advantages to rigging out a DSLR and a mirrorless camera, um, because it's cheaper. It's more customizable to the needs that I have, and I can break it down and do other things with it. I can do photography with it, throw it on a gimbal, that sort of thing. Whereas with the cinema cameras, you can't do that. There's a place for both. I would love to have a cinema camera in the future. And I hope to someday be able to afford that. But right now it's been a slow buildup of acquiring gear and building it out. And right now, yeah, this is this is an expensive rig right here. It is um, in total. I don't, I don't even know how much it is in total. Um, the Sony like A7S rig that I built out, I think it was like between six and seven thousand dollars total when I added it all up in that one in that video you may have seen, which is the price of a cinema camera like we just looked at. It's the price of a Sony FX6. But I didn't have six seven thousand dollars to just drop at the you know at the time but slowly over time i've been able to invest that much into it so that's why i just haven't bought a cinema camera outright it's been a slow build up all right um keep going down here lots lots of questions i still want to get to let's see uh davidson says small rig is a good choice for rig items are cheap and got a good got a good build quality absolutely small rig parts are so quality honestly i've never had one a part a single part break on me um, nothing. I don't know. I'm just thinking back on that. They've all been really, really reliable and they're a great price, cheaper than Tilta. I love the look of a lot of the Tilta stuff, but much more expensive. It's almost twice the price for every little bit and bob that they do. It's so much more expensive. Um, all right, here we go. Um, Brenson Pass says, do you think shooting natively RF or converting RF to EF for the larger lineup of cinema lenses? Yeah, so it depends on what you want to do, of course. Um, I hate that. Oh, it depends. Everyone always says that, right? It depends, but it really does. If you are shooting with a cinema camera, let's let's go with the red Komodo because it has a native RF mount, um, and you need the autofocus out of that, and you can rely on the autofocus out of the red Komodo, then yes, get, get an RF mount lens. It's going to do so much better than using an adapter and trying to get that adapter to work well with autofocus because as as I'm sure you've all experienced, the little adapters for your autofocus never work super great and sometimes aperture control doesn't work great or just stops working, the electronic adapters. Um, but honestly, if you're doing more work behind the camera yourself and being the camera operator, uh, the DP, the cinematographer, the director, whatever you want to call yourself, um, then I would probably go with Canon EF lenses and just use an adapter um, because 
it's it's so much they're so much cheaper canon ef lenses are way cheaper they're way more um, easily accessible. So many third-party companies make Canon EF lenses. You can adapt them to whatever other camera you want to in the future. And you can use that cool little adapter that allows you to put a variable ND filter in between. I'm sure you guys have seen that, but you can get a little variable ND filter adapter to go from Canon EF to um, R. So that's really cool. So yeah, that's my take. I would, I would definitely buy EF. If I ever get the red Komodo, I probably won't buy any R mount lenses probably stick with all EF and adapt. Um, Davidson says, have you heard about SLR magic lenses? I'm still between them or EF versions of Zine. Yes, I have not shot with the SLR magic lenses, but I have heard they have some nice full frame ones that are cine lenses. I would love to test them out and just see the quality of them. Um, I would love to know, but I haven't yet. Um, be interesting to, to check out in the future. All right, uh, Nelkin Nisbet says, would a Super 35 be a good middle ground between full frame and micro four thirds? Yes, of course. Um, he says, good night, by the way. So hopefully you can catch this back on the live stream, man. Um, but yes, of course. I mean, micro four thirds is it's a good mount. It's great for the pocket 4K. But for me, the shallow depth of field is not good enough. You need really wide angle lenses to get a similar um, field of view as you would on a crop sensor or a full frame, and it's it does much worse in low light. Um, so yes, Super 35 is a great way to go. For those of you that don't know, Super 35 and Crop Sensor APS-C are almost the same. Super 35 is usually a little bit wider, um, but they're almost the same. All right. Brian Gillings, greetings from Jamaica. What's up? Uh, he says, Best starter cinema photography camera. I've started with the Canon SL2, but I've found a love for cinematography. Yeah, we've we've talked about this a bit on the channel, like well, in this live stream earlier. Depends on your budget, depends on what you want to do. But I'd say the pocket cinema camera 6K is a great way to go if you're going to be behind the camera and you want to manually focus on everything. Otherwise, if you want to go with something that has um, autofocus and you want to spend a little bit more money, I would go with the Sony A7S III. That's a great option. Um, there are just so many cameras. And if you want to be a little bit more in budget and you don't want full frame, go with the Fujifilm X-T4 or X-T3. I love the look of both of those cameras and they're much more affordable. Um, all right. Uh, Alexandra, Alexander, sorry. Alexander Hogdale says, what do you think of just having, just saving up for an Alexa X-T? about 14,000 instead of spending so much time on researching and upgrading <laughs> crappier cameras all the time. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what's funny is those are the kind of questions that I get frequently. That's why the title of this video is why don't you just buy a cinema camera? Well, $14,000 is a lot of money to save up over time first off. I mean, that would take, you know, for many people, many years to do. Um, some people have that much in savings already, but it's hard to convince your wife to let you buy a $14,000 camera out of the blue. Um, yeah, I, I think the problem with that is that you're going to need to completely rig out that camera. The Alexa XT and other Alexa cameras do not come video ready. There's things you have to buy, rails, battery solutions, grips, EVFs, map boxes, follow focuses, all the junk you need to make that camera perform the way that you want to. I mean, look at any behind the scenes on any like real film set. They're, those cameras are just really built out and it's very expensive. So 14 grand, that might be the entry level spot, but you might spend another $5,000 rigging it out and you're at like nineteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So that's just my take on it. It'd be nice, but I don't think I'll be doing anything like that anytime, anytime soon. All right. Um, Nelkin says a fellow Caribbean brother. Yeah, is it Caribbean or Caribbean? Let me know. I still think that's a great debate. How do you say it? Um, let's see, Cine... Cinethesia. Um, okay, you guys are talking about the SR Magic lenses. I think they're pretty nice. Um, yeah, he's saying he doesn't like the look of zines. Yeah, I hear that from some people. They don't they don't like the look of them. They're maybe too clinical, maybe a little bit too much green cast is what I hear. They're very similar to the Rokinons, but um, Ellen Sherman says, uh, what do you think about the Pocket 6K not having a PL mount adapter? Um, I think that there is a PL mount adapter out there that another company has made because I swear I've seen like rig pics of people with PL mount lenses on the Pocket 6K, but I think they're a little bit more like sketch 
Um, and I think it's a huge deal, honestly. Most lenses, you can do a swap. For instance, you know, I did this whole review on the DZL Films lenses. This comes with a Canon EF mount or a PL mount. It's interchangeable. So there's a handful of screws on the back here. Pull them all out, swap in the PL mount, good to go or swap it out for the EF and just put it right on there. I think it's a huge deal, depending on the cinema lens you're using. If it has a PL mount, you may be able to interchange that for a Canon EF mount. So not too big of a deal. I think there's some adapters out there. Um, honestly, I think there's at least one. I've seen something, something floating around. Um, Alexander Hogdell says, DZO Film has some prime lenses that look better than Zine and are pretty cheap. Yeah, they've come out with their whole line of prime lenses now and for full frame, which I think is definitely cool. Um, I would love to test those out in the future. Let's see. Pratham says, is the A6400 good for cinematic B-rolls? Sure. I think it depends on what you're shooting, right? The cinematic quality of any video is really what you're shooting. It's not the camera, although we all, as kind of like tech freaks, I think like to hope that the tech and the lenses is what makes it a good image. It's always what you're shooting. It's the location, it's the subject matter, the person that, whoa, knocking over my water bottle, the outfit that they're wearing, whatever it is. Um, those are the things that really make um, an image cinematic. So yeah, you can shoot great looking stuff with the A6400, although it's, it's a more affordable, um, cheaper entry level camera. Um, I think it's definitely a good camera. All right, um, let's see here. Uh, Thompson Bellingroth says, I'd like to ask about frame rates, but if I may go back a bit, let's talk Tri-X BW film. Hmm. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about there. Um, I haven't shot on a film camera before, like film video film camera or anything. So I'm not sure that I can exactly respond to that very well. Um, and frame rates. There's lots of good frame rates. I'm always shooting at 24 frames per second. Unless I need to slow down, it's going to be 60 or 120 frames per second. Um, let's see. Nelkin Nisbet says, um, didn't, don't know if you remember the stream you did on beginner stuff, I think, but I went with the Sony a6400 with the 18 to 105. Oh, that's cool. Um, very cool. I, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed that camera. He says, is a6400 good for cinematic B-rolls? the budget and put that in there a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I think, I think you can definitely get a great looking image. If you've been disappointed with the image that you've been getting, maybe change up what you've been shooting, the location, the person, the, the thing, and try some new techniques, try better lighting, that sort of thing. Shooting at golden hour. Those are all going to make your images look better than just shooting out in bright, crappy sunlight. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, all right, sorry, I'm trying to catch up with what's going on here. It's hard to keep up with the chat. Okay, UV Talking says I'm from India. Say hi to me, my name is Yuvraj. Sorry, probably messed that up, what's up? Um, Jose, hello, greetings from Chile, how you doing? Chile, I think is how they say it. Um, people talking about different adapters, that's great. Uh, Jose says, is the A7 III still relevant in 2021? Should I invest my money in the FX6 or wait for the FX3? <laughs> yeah, we talked about the FX3 earlier. It looks cool. I'm excited. I really want to test that one out, see what the specs are, see if it's real. Um, yeah, A7 III still totally relevant. Maybe consider the A7C if you want a smaller camera package, but the same exact sensor and capabilities. Um, the A7C is great. That's a cool looking camera, flip out screen. Um, but yeah, A7 III, A7C, definitely still relevant, good full frame and good more entry level price. Um, the FX6 is gonna cost you three times the price and the FX3, who knows? I don't know the price, but it's probably gonna be more expensive, so it depends on your budget. Um, Visual R says, what are the specs to consider a camera in the cinema world for you? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think it's the specs. Um, there aren't any specific specs to me that make a camera a cinema camera. The original um, Canon, uh, what was it? The Canon um, C100 only shot in 1080p, right? Canon C300, uh, uh, not C, yeah, C300 Mark I shot in 1080p. Not very good specs, 
but it was a cinema camera. And there are plenty of other ones that only shot in 1080p or still cinema camera. So it's not the specs, it's more of the body style. It's does it have all the buttons on the side to make it actually function as a cinema camera. Um, let me see if I can pull, pull that up. I don't even know if, it's probably not even listed anymore because it's so out of date. But pull up the Mark II at least. So Canon C300 Mark II, 7,500 bucks. Um, yeah, what really is making this a cinema camera, built-in ND filters, all the buttons on the side for adjusting your settings really quickly. And of course, better battery life. You know, you're getting that uh, XLR inputs and you're getting all these different inputs and outputs on the back time code, you're getting SDI output and H full H full size HDMI output. All of these things are what make a camera more, um, uh, more of a cinema camera, all of the inputs and outputs. Whereas with these little mirrorless cameras, DSLRs, they just don't have all of these inputs and outputs and buttons and things on them that really make them much more functional for uh, broadcast and cinema camera style shoots. So yeah, I don't think it's quite the specs. The specs vary. It's more of the body and everything it's able to do for sure. Um, all right, try to try to keep up here. Okay. Um, let's see. Yuva Film says, "Can you please explain our E values of zebra lines? What should we select on A7S3 for wide shots?" <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe I'll do a more detailed breakdown of that in the future, but basically IRE values, look it up, look up a chart and it'll tell you exactly what you need. But skin tones for lighter skin tones, you're usually gonna be targeted around 70 IRE. So maybe you should set your zebras at 70 to show up. So if you start seeing zebras at say like 75 or something, you might be overexposing the skin. Um, that could be a good place to set them. Some people set them at 100 IRE, which means your image is going to start clipping if you're shooting in Rec. 709. Um, that means you're losing all that information in the highlights if you just set it to 100 and you see those zebras come up, you know, hey, I'm overexposing, I'm clipping, I'm gonna dial it back and get rid of those zebras. I'll need to do a more detailed video on that. Um, hopefully that helps. All right. Um, uh, stay tuned guitar says is there any problem with shooting in ProRes 1080p on the pocket 6k? Uh, no, I think that's fine. I It's hard to say I think uh, I need to look it up But I don't I don't I'm not positive if it crops in if if you shoot in 1080p on the pocket 6k Does it crop in or does it still use the full sensor if it does crop in that would be a problem because you're gonna need much wider lenses um Try and answer the rest of these questions and then we'll we'll be wrapping the live stream soon. We've been going for an hour and 20. I know viewership is going down. Everyone's like been hanging on for a while. I'll try to get all your questions and then we'll we'll start wrapping up. Uh, let's see, Pratham says, Fujifilm lenses are expensive. Check out the Viltrox. Just did a full review on them. There are some more affordable options. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, you're talking about different lenses again. Pratham says, are there third-party lenses for the X-T3? Yes, like I said, Viltrox, check those out. Did did review of two different Viltrox lenses from them, the 23 and the 56 millimeter. Great lenses, very affordable. All right. Um, okay. I'm sorry if I skip, skip anything here, but... Uh, Tim... Tim Butt 2 says, saw the thumbnail picture and I think I just saw the DZO Film 2055 mainly. Clicked because I've been using those lenses, loving them, used them on my um, G2 and the Pocket 6K, mainly prefer PL mount. Yep, I have them right here. So this is the DZO Film 20 to 55. I've got the 50 to 125 here. And yeah, they've been looking really good. That's awesome that you have them. I think they're great lenses. They, they give you a nice cinematic quality. They're not overly sharp and they get nice and wide open at T2.8. Um, yeah, I love it. And it's interesting you say you prefer the PL mount um, on the Pocket 6K. Uh, do you have an adapter to go to PL or are you, are you switching out to the Canon EF mount? Let me know. Uh, Salah says, greetings from Eastern Arabia. How you doing? Uh, Timbut2 also says, Super 35 is still the standard for cinema. Full frame is Vista Vision and cinema. And, and don't go telling Spielberg because movies aren't full frame because he shot Super 35 for so long. Yeah, so you're exactly right. Super 35 is definitely still the standard in film and TV shows. There are not a lot of 
film and television shows being shot in full frame, it's happening more and more frequently with, you know, the Alexa large formats and the red um, 8K Monstro and those full frame cameras. Obviously, the Sony FS, uh, FX9 and FX6 just added their full frame lines. Um, it's going to continue to happen more, but Super 35 has been the standard for so long. Uh, Majesty Suit. Suteja, sorry, I'm terrible at names, says love from Indonesia. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, also Light says, what's the cheapest anamorphic lens that you know of and would you actually use it? We talked about this earlier in the live stream. You can go back and, and check that out. But the Siru or Siru anamorphics are the cheapest. Not my favorite though, because they're only a 1.33 um, compression ratio, which doesn't give you the most anamorphic look. The Vasins are the next most expensive at 1.8 um, squeeze. Also, a little bit too expensive, still in that $3,500, $4,000 range, and it's not as nice. The Atlas anamorphics are definitely the best, but they're $8,000. So no, no anamorphic lenses that I'll be buying anytime in the future until they make a two-time squeeze. It's cheaper, sub $2,000. Um, let's see, what else? Am I missing anything else, guys? Um, trying to keep up. Robert Harazzo says, do you think RF mount is the future or EF? Definitely will always be the king. Yeah, uh, like I've said, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler for this, but EF is the way I will be going for all future lenses because I can adapt it to any camera body that I want. If I buy RF mount, like Canon probably wants to do because they're really expensive, uh, I'm stuck shooting Canon mirrorless cameras, that's it. But with Canon EF mount like this, I can put it on any camera that I want because you can adapt to mirrorless cameras um, very easily with just a Canon EF mount to whatever adapter it is, RF or whatever. So. It's very easy to do. That's why I'm doing it. But if you need autofocus and that sort of thing, you don't have manual lenses, you've got to go F RF mount with, you know, Canon EOS R's. Um, Visual R says A6500 still worth it. Of course. Um, that's what I'm shooting on right now with this live stream. I was just talking about it earlier. Good autofocus. I would love to see 10-bit APS-C camera from Sony. Please make it happen, guys. Oh my gosh, Sony, I've talked about this before, but make a crop sensor camera with 10-bit, Fujifilm X-T4, GH5. All these cameras have had 10-bit for a while and they need to make it happen. Whew, guys, go at Sony on Twitter and just destroy them. Please make an APS-C camera with 10-bit. All right, um, let's see. Okay, stay tuned, Guitar says, no crop full sensors. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Diego, he says, what are your thoughts on the Lumix S5 in comparison with the X-T4? Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit earlier here with the S5. Um, I think it's a, it's a great looking camera, but it's a matter of what lenses you're using on there. It's expensive to get the native ones if you decide to go native. Um, there's just not as many options, but it looks like a great camera. I love being able to get ProRes RAW out of that. I think that's really cool. Um, all right. Timbut2 says, PL on the Ursa Mini Pro. If I use the DZO film Pictor zooms on the Pocket 6K, I change the mount back to EF, but I prefer using the PL on the Ursa Mini Pro. Nice. Thanks for answering that. Um, ben Folsom, what's up? He says, anyone in here have the Komodo? I don't know. Yeah, raise your hand if you guys have it. I wish I did. It'd be nice to... It'd be nice to test out a uh, fun looking camera. All right, um, Nelkin says, uh, thanks as usual. Hope everybody has a wonderful night. Awesome, have a good night. Um, ben Folsom says, do you think the Komodo is worth the price? That's a loaded question. Um, $6,000 and you still got to rig it out. Still not quite a, it's a cinema camera, but it's missing a lot of the features of a cinema camera, right? It's not a Canon C300 Mark II or an Ursa Mini Pro. It doesn't have all the full inputs and outputs that you get on a more traditional cinema camera. Um, I think it's worth it if you want red code raw and you love the look of that image and that sensor and just working with that codec. Codec, I think it's great, especially if you want to be in the red, you know, universe. Um, coming up on the end here, guys, it's been an hour and a half. If you've been getting value out of this, you've been liking this, smash the like button. Still got 57 people watching. If y'all hit like right now, we might be able to get this up. Like, like, like. I appreciate all the feedback. Um, Davidson, Davidson says, good night. 
Right. Uh, Timbut2 says, I have I also got my DZO film Vespid Primes in PL because again, I prefer that mount. I've thought about doing, I've thought about doing the PL modification from wooden camera for the Pocket 6K. Okay, that's what it is. We were talking about this earlier. Is there an adapter to go PL mount on the um, uh, the Pocket 6K? And yes, there is one from wooden camera like he's talking about here. Um, so, I mean, check check that out. Maybe you guys can hit up Tim Butt to see what he's doing there. Um, yeah, I would love to know. How are the DZO film Vespid Primes? They look they look nice. It'd be cool to check them out. Um, Enchanting Images and Art says, what's your thoughts on getting Micro Four Thirds in 2021? Not for me. Uh, I will never buy a Micro Four Thirds lens or camera. Um, and I, and I know there, that you can get really good stuff out of the Pocket 4K and the GH5. I've seen really great stuff, but it's harder to get a shallow depth of field. You, you have to have a lens that opens up way more to like 1.5, 1.8, that sort of thing to get a shallow depth of field. Uh, it's just the science of it. The sensor size is smaller, so the shallow depth of field doesn't happen as easily. You need a more wide open lens. Um, it does worse in low light, and I find myself shooting in low light situations pretty frequently, so I at least need APS-C. Of course, full frame is the best for low light, um, but yeah, I won't be buying Micro Four Thirds if you're just getting started and those things aren't a big concern to you. I would say go for it. Uh, the Pocket 4K is a great cam, the GH5 great cam, but it's just not just not for me. The lenses are much cheaper. That's really nice. Um, One World, he says, I recently got the Sony A6300. Any thoughts on it? Great camera, good place to start. I'm on the A6500 for this live stream. Yeah, I think you made a good choice. Um, Pascal Dante says, hi, what's up? He says, are Cine Zooms better than Primes? Uh, Cine Primes, I've done an entire deep dive on this in my last video on this channel, all about the Pictor Zooms. Go watch that after this, I'm about to wrap. It answers that question completely. Same with the last live stream I did on Primes versus Zooms, I answer that in detail. Um, but the quick answer, they both have their advantages and they both have their disadvantages. But go watch those videos. It explains it much deeper. Um, Timba2 says he just tested the Komodo in the last week. Rental through friend. I like it, but he would still choose his Ursa Mini Pro for that price comparing to the Pocket 6K. It has the features I like, but won't get me to buy. Yeah, I mean, the Ursa Mini Pro has all of the real cinema features that you need, all the inputs and outputs where for that similar price, range, you're not getting that quite with the red Komodo. You're just getting that red name and that red image. All right, Sloan test. Sorry, I'm trying to get to all your answers, all your questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap. It says, best camera, best camera body for $2,500 in US for a video with a leaning towards cinematic footage, music videos, nature, anamorphic lens comp, uh, capability. That's an easy answer. It's the Pocket 6K, absolutely. Um, you can shoot anamorphic on the, pic, the Pocket 6K, there are a lot of other cameras that don't let you shoot anamorphic. They don't de-squeeze it. Um, $2,500 will get you a great looking image out of the pocket 6K. That's the route that I would go. Um, let's see, Calif Ocean, what's up? He says, are you available for hire as a DP? Yes, of course. Um, I work full time. For those of you guys that don't know, this is not my full time job. YouTube does not make, I do not make hardly any money off of this channel. Not enough to support a family. I have two kids, a wife. Um, and yes, I work full time at a studio doing video production. And sometimes I do jobs on the side as well, outside of my full time employment, um, where I DP little commercials and ads and things like that. So, of course, um, Timba2 says, I love the Vested Primes. I have a review on my Vimeo and YouTube channel. Yeah, I'll check that out, man. I will definitely check that out after this. I'd love to see um, how they look. Um, Ethan Rothschild says, 4K or 6K from Blackmagic Thox. Thoughts on the camera in general? Quick answer, Pocket 6K all the way because I love the Canon EF mount, native, no adapters needed, and you're getting an APS-C crop sensor instead of a micro four thirds. Those two things alone are a huge advantage to me. Um, yeah, all my lenses are Canon EF for the most part, so that's the way that I would go. Um, DK has said something in another language I can't read, but what's, <laughs> what's up? Um, cool. And finally, Ham72, blah, 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 says, have you thought about the Zcam E2 line of cameras? Sorry, I'm late. That's fine. Welcome, welcome to the last little bit of this live stream, man. Um, yes, I've looked at the Zcams. 
short answer, I won't be buying any. I know there, there may be some people watching this that have it, and I think that's awesome. You're probably getting good results. But what I will say is it's still, to me, kind of like a camera in beta. I think that they're still just like learning and iterating. They're small as a company and they're growing. They have a, like a lot of legwork to do and mostly like in their firmware, their autofocus, um, their color science, like their log profiles and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's ready for me to buy yet. I need it to the kinks and things like that to be worked out more, but it looks like a really cool camera. I love that small form factor. I love the price point, but Z cam, I just don't think is um, the right pro camera for me yet but it's close, they're headed in the right direction. And what they're doing, like I said this earlier, is driving the market to follow. You're seeing these little box style cameras more and more frequently um, because of companies like Zcam, they're seeing the success of that. Other companies see that and go, wow, that's really successful. A lot of guys are liking that. We can make a similar body style, but do it better or make it different or whatever. So it's a really good thing for us. Um, it pushes other companies, maybe Canon, maybe Blackmagic, whoever it is will come out with more of those styles. Um, that the Z cam has, like Red Komodo has, but I won't be buying one anytime soon. Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. Um, Andrew Freeman says, dig the mushroom shirt. Thank you. Yeah, it's just kind of a random shirt, glows in the dark, whatever. I don't know, I thought it was fun. I love like just colorful random shirts and stuff. Um, let's see, Diego says, what do you think about the SLR Magic Micro Primes? Could you review them? I haven't shot on them yet. I've heard really good things. I'll have to check them out in the future. And... Giancarlo says, thoughts on the EOS R. Um, ah, my thoughts, you're not going to like it. I wouldn't buy it, but that's because um, I think you can't, you you ha you crop in when you shoot in 4K um, and 1080p is, I think, the only way to get the full frame sensor out of the EOS R. There's some limitations there. Um, yeah, there's just too many limitations for me on the EOS R. Maybe you go with the EOS R5, but I still, I just way too expensive. Um, I would go more the Fujifilm route, the Blackmagic route, the Sony route. I've kind of stepped away from Canon. I'm just, I don't think I'll be going back to Canon cameras for a long time. Still love their Canon EF mounts. Um, all right, gonna wrap here soon. Again, guys, please like and subscribe and everything like that if you're watching this and you haven't already and you've been enjoying this. Uh, Brian Gilling says, you mentioned the Pocket 6K. Why not the 4K version since I'd be starting out? Um, yeah, the price difference isn't huge. The Pocket 6K is $2,000. The Pocket 4K, I think, is like $1,400. Yes, it's more expensive, but there's just so many more advantages to the 6K with the Canon EF mount and a APS-C uh, sensor size. Um, find a Pocket 6K used, and you're probably going to be getting closer to that Pocket 4K price new. That would, that's just the route that I would go. Um, all right. <laughs> You guys keep coming at me with questions. I, I want to get to them, but I also need to, to wrap up and let you guys get on with your lives. Uh, finally, filmmaker Anto says, GH5 user, and I just updated my lighting kit. Do you suggest investing in a camera to the, the pocket camera or just build my overall inventory like grips and stuff? Just stumbled across your channel, good info and sub. Hey, thanks for the sub, man. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I would probably rig out your camera more get the accessories and things that you want, um, build it out into something that you really like, like, you know, side handle, top handle, monitor mounts. You know, this one just bends exactly where you want it. V mount batteries, follow focus, kind of rig it out to be the camera that you want it to be, then invest in a second camera, but get one really good A camera working for you first. Um, Davidson says he's back. <laughs> welcome back. We're just wrapping up Davidson, but welcome back. Um, Brian Gilling says, thank you. Excellent stream. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. It's been just a ton of fun hanging out with you. I try to do these weekly live streams. They're usually at night. They're never scheduled. Sorry about that. But my life is always busy with other things, with other uh, family work, that sort of stuff. But I appreciate it. If you haven't already, be sure that you're subscribed, like, and go watch some of my previous videos that I just posted all about some of these new lenses that have come out. Um, a lot of great stuff coming out continue to be coming out on the channel. Thank you guys again. I love all the comments and questions and everything. It's just so much fun to engage with other filmmakers on the internet. You guys are awesome. Um, stay tuned. There'll be more stuff coming out, more live streams next week, more videos dropping. I appreciate it, guys. Have an awesome night. We will see you guys later. Adios.